So another image of the Wiggers diagram showing these changes in pressure over time throughout the cardiac cycle. So in the left ventricle, left atrium and aorta, similar changes would be seen in the right side, but the pressure wouldn't reach quite such a high um, level because the right side of the heart does not need to pump to the whole systemic circulation. It's just pumping nearby to the lungs. So the same volumes would be pumped, but not at the same pressures. Pressure is going to allow for increased flow. The other thing that's on this image that wasn't on the previous one I drew is the EKG. So here are the components of the EKG that you know about that correspond to these um, to contraction events, which correspond to pressure events. So the P wave is atrial depolarization. It's going to cause but um, atrial contraction, and that's going to cause an increase in pressure in the atria. So you might imagine we could look at what happens to blood flow, which we already have talked about with these changes in pressure, right? That's why we care about pressure. Um, pressure is going to cause flow. And we'll look at more of the physics of this um, with both respiratory and blood pressure. But if we wanna have flow happen, we have to have a pressure. If we have a pressure change, the point of this is to have blood flow. And you already know that, right? You know that this is going to be ventricular ejection happening right here. Let's look at that. So this graph here is, um, this image is ventricular volume. Pretty simple and it makes sense. We've got an increase in ventricular volume as we have filling of the ventricles, passive filling, and then atrial systole um, to top it off. Then we've got a dramatic decrease in ventricular volume as we have that ventricular ejection. Do note here that the increase in pressure continues beyond when the blood flow starts exiting. Um, there's a delay in, in the consequence of blood flow um, on pressure. So this is a dramatic increase in pressure that's gonna cause ventricular ejection. Pressure blips over a bit even though blood flow has already begun flow, going out. So just note that um, to help it make sense. These changes in volume, which you also can see down here, we've, we've looked at these already, have names. So we've got something called a stroke volume. This is probably the most important one. We'll use it the most. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected during that, um, that stroke, during that contraction. And it's not equal to the exactly to the blood that, that we started with. It's going to be equal to that blood we start with minus the blood remaining in the heart. The heart doesn't pump out every single drop of blood. So there's, of course, names for these two. The end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that is the, the maximum is what we're starting with before that contraction. So after passive filling and then atrial contraction, the, the ventricle is full of blood and diastolic volume. What's left after contraction is called the end systolic volume after contraction. And that is a lot less, but it's not zero. So because it's not zero, the stroke volume is, is not the same as what we, what we started with. So that's those terms. Let's do a practice with this. I'm gonna show you another image of this, this dynamics of the left side of the heart. This is a new picture, but it's the same information. I want you to look down here and, and determine stroke volume. So there is end diastolic volume. End diastolic volume is about 125 milliliters. And systolic volume is about 40 milliliters. 125 minus 40 is 85 milliliters. That's stroke volume. That's how much the heart is ejecting during this event here. It's because of this pressure increase. I'm sorry, because of this pressure increase really. The other thing that's on this image, two more things I want to talk about. 
One is this one shows the valves. So that's kind of helpful for seeing what really what causes this increase in pressure. In addition to contraction events, you've got to have the chambers be closed at the right times. So the AV valve is going to close just before that isovolumic contraction. The color here. And going to correspond with that sharp increase in pressure. When that pressure gets great enough, that's going to cause the aortic valve to open, right? That's what's happening right here and causing blood to flow out. And note there's that increase in pressure beyond that that's um, a delayed effect. You then have the aortic valve close again. Again, same thing's going to happen on the right side of the heart. We're looking at the, the left side right now. When the aortic valve closes, there's this dichrotic notch seen in the aortic blood pressure that's a result of that aortic valve closing. Then we um, have the AV valves open again so that the ventricles can fill. So that's going to be ventricular filling, right? Both the passive and then the atrial contraction. The other thing I want to note on this image, next week's going to be a, more about blood pressure, but this is the first place I want to introduce, um, and I already did once, blood pressure. What's the blood pressure of this individual? Could you, could you tell me? So we want aortic blood pressure, even though we're going to measure it in the brachial artery, it's going to be the same. We just can't measure it in the aorta, very invasive, um, and it's going to give us the same pressures to measure in the brachial artery. Systolic blood pressure, that's the blood pressure during systole, the max blood pressure, pretty much. And then diastolic, that's the blood pressure during relaxation. So that's the minimum at the aorta, right? We're not measuring blood pressure in the ventricle because that would go even lower. So that's why this is 80, this is 120, Systolic over diastolic is how this is reported. And that's 120 over 80 in this individual. And that's a healthy blood pressure.